Okay. So let's play something very offbeat. I feel like playing something offbeat. Um, if we're playing white, we'll play a queen's gambit, but if, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna play e5, and guess what we're gonna play, guys? Yeah, I was considering going for the Latvian, but let's play the elephant gambit, and I, or we can play the Stafford. You know, let's play the Stafford. Let's play the Stafford. No, 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 let's play the Stafford. In honor of my boy Eric, let's play the Stafford. The, yeah, he doesn't take. See, I was worried about that move. Yeah, damn. Boo, boo, boo. Okay. So let's make an offbeat opening out of this. Don't worry, don't despair. I have an idea. Now, bishop c4 is, I think, not a very good move. We can we can take e4, but I'm a little bit worried about doing that. I'm not sure what the theory is there. We could play knight c6 and transpose to the Italian. But another interesting move that we could make, I plan to play the elephant gambit on this move. So guess what? Since his bishop is on c4, he literally walks into a favorable version of the elephant gambit. Let's play d5 and then e4. Let's go for this line. No, bishop c4 is fine, and I'm sure that white is uh, objectively better here, but this is like an improved elephant gambit where he's lost a couple of tempi and we get all the moves we want to play anyway. Knight g5. Okay, so he's already going to be in trouble here pretty quickly. This is a mistake. I'm pretty sure. So... He's trying to play it in the style of a fried liver, and I think he's not fully appreciating the fact that the d5 pawn is blocking the bishop, so knight takes f7 is not a serious threat. And one important thing to understand here is that knight takes f7, king takes f7, d6 check may seem scary, but it only seems scary because that's a discovered check. Discovered checks aren't always scary, we can just go bishop e6, and he's going to run out of attacking pieces. So what shall we do? Tempe. h6. Get out of here. Get out of g5, and he's got to drop back to h3. And that's a very problematic move. Now, a lot of people, let's wait for him to go in h3, because I have a sense that he might sacrifice on f7. I have a feeling uh, from the early signs of how he's playing that he might sack the knight. So we'll see. He's definitely contemplating it. Yeah, I'll explain knight takes d5 after the game. Yeah, he goes knight h3. Okay, good. So here, th there's an instructive moment here um, where a lot of players would immediately grab this knight and ruin his kingside pawn structure and then play knight takes d5. And that's good. Black is probably better there, but you should always be looking for ways to improve on the initial ideas you come up with. And that's a mentality that masters and GMs have naturally. You never rush into an idea before, even after you've decided that that's the direction you want to go in, you're always looking for ways to optimize uh, and improve uh, the general idea you've decided on. There's a very nice way of doing that here. If you look at his queen, it's uh, his entire queen side is undeveloped. And so there exists the move bishop to g4. Now, what's the idea? Well, his queen is trapped. He has to block that attack on the bishop, and he can do that in one of two ways. The move f3 exposes his position way too much. We just take that pawn, and he can't take back because he loses the knight. And if he plays bishop e2, well, then we've induced him into making his position even more passive. Then we take the knight, and then we take on d5, and he can't even trade that knight. And in addition, we could take the d5 pawn with the queen if we wanted to. So it's not about winning the d pawn. It's about making his position as passive as possible. Um, because the d pawn, we could, we could have won it back anyway. So you can see this is a simple way of improving the position. F3, he plays. Okay, wow. He plays F3. All right. That's pretty uh, pretty crazy to me because I think we're winning on the spot. Now, bishop takes H3 would be an improved version nonetheless of, uh, of this line. But we don't have to play bishop takes H3 anymore. This pawn on G2 is overloaded. So we play E takes F3. And I think he's just totally lost here. We're threatening F takes G2. We're threatening F2 check. He has to take on F3 if I'm understanding this correctly. And then we win a piece. And his whole, his entire king side is in shambles. Yeah, this is totally game over. Now, as he's thinking, I'm going to grab a book that I have to show you. OK, sorry. Now he castles. So here it's important to be precise. And as many of you are indicating, yeah, goodbye. F2, goodbye, queen. And it's over. 
Okay, so one important point here, don't rush into taking this pawn, prioritize development. Why keep the king stranded in the center? The simplest is to play bishop e7 and castle. And I, I have yet to find a name for this rule, but I would call this rule relative, again, this is all about prioritization because see, bishop c5 is a more active developing move, but the priorities have shifted. We no longer need to make sure that every piece is as active as possible. The priority now is on sheltering the king so that we can get to, down to the business of just checkmating him, right? And using our extra queen. And bishop c5 would be slightly inaccurate due to rookie one check and we'd have to move the king. And why bother with that when you can guarantee the safety of the king? So knight takes d5 here would be a blunder. Uh, for what reason? And what should we do here? How should we develop in the most efficient way? What, how could, do we make sure that we don't let him live here? He hangs the bishop, bishop, day, bishop d5, queen d5, and rook e7. So instead we have two options. We can go knight d7, and then knight b6, and then knight b takes d5. Or, guess what? Now that we've castled, we can improve the activity of our pieces by saying now we can play bishop, exactly curious, bishop c5, pinning the knight, uh, and preparing all sorts of nasty shenanigans like knight g4. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you for the trade. And finally, now that we've unburdened ourselves uh, from the bishop, we can just play knight takes d5. And finally, we can win that pawn back. Now that, not that we need that pawn that much, uh, but it's a good idea because now we can develop the other knight to c6. I'm really nitpicking here. We're up a queen, for God's sakes. But consider this like target practice. When you're up a queen, practicing being as precise as possible is a very good idea because you know that you're going to win the game anyway. And you can really cement good habits when you're up material because the stakes are relatively low. You, it's hard to screw up. Okay, knight c6, uh, develop the last piece. Now, notice that knight e5 is a pretty big, you know, pretty big threat just to trade off his bishop. Yeah, so let's go knight e5. Yeah, I think, um, now obviously it is possible to lose a game up a queen. And I have, and many people have. But, um, you know, it, it it's always a good idea to, to work on those habits because the moment you start relaxing, and the bad habits creep in, you're going to pay the price for that. Okay, so rook f5, he's pinning the queen. What's the most efficient move here? Thank you, ace cuber, for the prime. What's the most efficient way to win? Thank you, Montana. Well, the pleasure is all mine. No! You guys got debated. Knight f3, rook takes f3. Don't forget that the piece which is being targeted in a discovered check could itself take the piece delivering the discovered check. That's something you always have to check for, no pun intended. So instead, a much simpler move. Let's play g6 and chase the rook away. Now, doesn't this weaken the king? Well, he's got no pieces to attack the king with, so that's not something we really care about. Where should the queen go? Well, c4 weakens the d4 square, so we slide the queen into d4, and the game is over. We're going to take b2, regardless of what he does. Even if he takes the knight on e5, we take on b2, and this rook is the more valuable one to take. Yeah, so I'm really nitpicking here, but I like taking this. Okay, well, also because he kind of pre-moved. But, um, you know, that wins a pawn as well, and it ruins his entire uh, queen side. Well, it, it's less about it being the inactive rook. It's more that, thank you, Hot Mom Lover. Yeah, I was waiting for you to gift a sub. The stream couldn't end until you gifted that sub. And it's more about, um, about his just winning a pawn and his whole queen side being ruined. It, it doesn't matter. Well, queen takes c5, knight c3. It, it, both options are totally winning. Don't make a big deal out of this. It, doesn't, it really doesn't matter. Okay, I don't even care. So really quickly, let's go over the game. Now, um, we were going for the Stafford. Unfortunately, he deprived us of that opportunity. Again, uh, I made a video on YouTube on refuting the Stafford. You can take a look at it. Nonetheless, I think the Stafford is a great weapon to have in your pocket. If you're 16, 1700, Eric does a phenomenal job of going over the tricks. Um, there's a lot of tricks and, you know, it, and, and the refutation ends with white being up a full pawn for no compensation. Cl white is not winning. White is very clearly better. And, you know, for a GM, it would be unthinkable to risk playing a line like this. But, um, you know, that certainly doesn't mean you shouldn't have it in, in your pocket. I did not refute it. Oh, okay. Was my analysis wrong? Refutation uh, is, again, it, it, 
I don't mean that condescending. Oh, I just busted the Stafford like that easily. But it, you know, a refutation, relatively speaking, for a you know at a GM level, it would be considered a refuted line. You can absolutely still attempt it, which is why I wanted to play it here. I hope I've made that very clear. And I hope I made that clear in the video itself, that I'm not trying to like be the party pooper. But relatively speaking, there is a lot more material on gambits than playing against them. And that's something that I wanted to redress. Thank you, Mickey Marsh, for the prime. All right. So he plays bishop c4, and I got a book pretty recently called The Exhilarating Elephant Gambit. And the elephant gambit is e4, e5, knight f3, d5. And it's one of those things that fly under the radar. It's considered to be terrible. And white is undoubtedly better here. White has many ways to get an advantage. But it's, you know, it's very tricky. And this is a long book written by two, I think, FIDE masters who are pretty good at analyzing stuff. And they come up with a lot of new ideas for black. I think their main recommendation is the move bishop to d6 here. There's also e4, but e4, I think, has been refuted completely. And, yeah, John is right. But bishop d6 is quite interesting. And I would recommend it if you're looking for one of those things which you can pull out once in a while if you want an interesting and fun position. Nobody at like a 17, 1800 level is going to know the best lines here. And if white plays it passively, then you can certainly get a combative, interesting type of position. Okay. Uh, so bishop c4 is very much possible, and here we can play knight c6 to transpose into a fried liver. But we decided to go for like an improved elephant gambit. I think d5 is a very good move, actually. The Latvian is completely refuted. The Latvian is almost losing for black, if I remember correctly. I don't quite remember what the reputation is, but I think it definitely starts with knight e5, queen f6. And I think the old move knight c4 recently made a comeback, but you'll have to check, and I'll have to check. I'll probably do a video on it sometime soon. So bishop c4, d5, e takes d5, e4, and now a very big mistake, knight g5. This, straight off the bat, puts white in trouble. I think the best idea would be to go knight e5, as you do in the elephant gambit, bishop d6, d4. And on passant is met with knight takes d3. There's, you know, this is, this is also interesting for black. Black gets very rapid development here. This is a nice bishop, but clearly not full compensation for the pawn. Thank you, Mickey March, for the 100. Queen e2 is viable. Yeah, queen e2 is possible. But even here, you could play bishop d6. And if white goes d3, saying, ah, well, now I've got you, I've won the pawn, black can castle, d takes e4, knight takes e4, and it's always dangerous when you've got these two pieces stacked. Uh, you've got to be super careful about it. All right? So... That's the bottom line. I'm not sure what the best option is here. You can definitely analyze this with an engine. Um, but that's uh, that's that's all she wrote. So knight g5, h6. And yeah, and now white is in big trouble. So knight f7, king f7, d6 check meets with bishop e6. And despite the fact that the king is on e6, white has zero pieces developed. So the king can just walk back to f7. And you could castle by hand. And knight h3, bishop g4 is a very important move. So bishop e2 was, relatively speaking, the only move. Bishop h3, gh. And I like taking on d5 with either piece, but I like taking with the knight because that opens up a pathway for the queen, and then knight can swing around to f4. But after d3, white is okay. White is surviving here. Black can maybe even go e3, trying to sack the pawn to get this check in. But, you know, white can play. White can definitely play. White is alive. So f3, ef is just game over. I don't think he has anything that he can do against the combined threats of f2 and f takes g2. So that's the end of the game here. I mean, he has to, he should have taken on f3 and given up a piece. But the issue is that he, his king is also in huge trouble here on top of everything else. So yeah, that's, uh, that's all she wrote. f2, knight f2, bishop d1, and the rest was easy. All right, you got it. Uh, you got it. Shadow. Queen's Gambit it is. Let's get one more in. Okay, and let's get a Queen's Gambit in. Assuming he plays d5, yep, we got a Queen's Gambit. Okay, Knight f6. So this is important because a lot of people play this move at this level. This is called the Marshal. And it's not a good opening, but white has to be very precise. Otherwise, you actually could get up, could end up in a little bit of trouble. 
So why is this not a good move? This is like a cross between a Grunfeld and a Queen's Gambit. It declined, and that's just not how this works. So you take on d5, and obviously the next move is super clear. You can play knight f3 first. That's one of the good moves, but I'll show you what I think is the best line, e4. And here's the thing that people should remember. A lot of players go knight c3 in this position because that looks very natural, right? Knight c3 is a mistake. It's a mistake because, and this is why the marshal can be appealing to some players. And I only found this out pretty recently when Magnus played this against me in a bunch of bullet games. I kept playing knight c3. Black has what move? So good, I'm glad you're, this is an important thing to learn. Does anybody know why knight c3 is inaccurate? It's not c5, but you're close. It's not c5, it's e5. The move e5 is highly unpleasant. And I'll show you guys after the game really quickly. But e5, d takes e5, he takes the queen with check. And either you take with the knight and give up the e4 pawn, or you take with the king, the knight swings over to g4, you've lost your castling rights, and you're going to lose back the extra pawn. Whereas after knight c3, e5, d5, black can play. Well, bishop b4 is not possible there due to queen a4. But black can just play bishop d6, and black is a very nice position. So what you need to do here is play a very hard move to, to find, if you don't know to play it, bishop d3. So first of all, you don't blunder the pawn because of bishop b5 check. And the point is that it stops and takes the sting out of e5. You just take on e5, and there's no queen trade possible. So you block, uh, you basically block the d-file. So bishop d3 is the best way to get an advantage. And now you have to continue playing very carefully. He plays g6. So it's possible to just play knight f3, but I'm not the biggest fan of allowing bishop g4, which puts sort of Grunfeld-esque pressure on the d4 pawn. So how should we... Um, how should we continue developing here in the most circumspect fashion? A move that I don't always like to play unless we have to. Yeah, so there's two possibilities. Knight e2 is a very nice move. Knight e2 intending to meet bishop g4 with f3. That's totally good. But another good way of developing, this is a little bit more principled, is to play h3 and knight f3. You can afford to do this because black's lost a bunch of tempi with these knight d5, knight f6 moves, so you can afford these types of niceties. Now we can play either knight c3 or we can castle. I don't think it really matters. Let's go knight c3. b6, now let's castle. And we've got a phenomenal position. We've got full central control, perfectly developed pieces. We just got one more thing left to develop and that's the bishop on c1. Where should we put it? No need to reinvent the wheel here. Where should we put the bishop? And one thing to get away to get out of the way immediately, e5 is not a good move. I talked about this yesterday, so you can check out the VOD, but the move e5 yields control of the d5 square. And that's a pretty important outpost for black. These pawns get stuck in mud, so you don't wanna play e5 unless you have a very specific follow-up. So there's two ways to develop the bishop. You can absolutely play bishop e3 here, 100%, three bucks, thank you so much. Um, and uh, you can do it through the website and, and you can support the pawn, but you don't really need to because uh, the pawn already has the support of the knight on f3. And if necessary, you can step back with this bishop and support it with the queen. So I think bishop e3 is a little bit on the passive side. Let's instead go to g5 and put more pressure on his position. Bishop f4 also very much possible. But there is a reason I chose bishop g5 over bishop f4 and I'll talk about that afterward. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good moves here. Don't overthink this. Plenty of good moves. It's, it's not always necessary to obsess over this stuff. Okay. So, knight f to d7, that's clearly passive, but possible. But now there's many ways to continue the, to continue the pressure. Um, if you don't want to reinvent the wheel, if you don't want to reinvent the wheel, then... The simplest is to go after this bishop. If we can eliminate this bishop, his king becomes weak. He loses some of the pressure on d4. So let's play queen d2 and bishop h6. That's very tried and true, old reliable, perfectly good. Nothing wrong with playing old reliable moves, particularly in such a dominant position. So c5, now our response here should be quite obvious to people. We certainly don't want to take on c5. That justifies his entire setup. We want to go d5, stopping him from doing, okay, knight e5. So I see what he's trying to do, but He's not going to be able to 
uh, to maintain the blockade over the dark squares that he's trying to establish. So, I mean, clearly we should take the knight. Now, it's interesting. Uh, one interesting thing that I think some it, it could benefit some people is is the concept that it's generally risky to move away from when you feed Keto your bishop and you move away from its its home. You venture out of the uh, square that you've created. That can involve a, a great deal of risk because you could end up with a situation when the bishop can't return back to g7. And you've got all these holes on the dark squares, and the bishop is susceptible to the move f4. So what I would propose is to first reposition the bishop to h6 to make him regret it. Okay, he comes back, but that gives us a very advantageous trade. He's giving us all the good stuff here. We don't have to take on g7. There's no rush, but there's also no real need to wait because we that, that's just another thing to worry about. I don't see a reason not to take, you know. Now there's many different plans here. We could absolutely go f4. We could go after the kingside attack, but... Since we played 1d4, I want to play a little bit more positionally. And playing positionally doesn't just mean like lame. No, we're going to go after him pretty quickly. But there's a couple of things left to involve in the game. And neither rook is currently doing all that much. Now let's leave this rook on f1. Because who knows? Maybe we'll want to play f4, f5. And the rook's going to come in handy, right? But this rook can certainly be doing a little bit more than it is. Now, a lot of you are saying rook a to e1. But here's the thing. I'm a little bit concerned that he's going to play e6 and try to open up his bishop. Where would you want the rook to be if he goes e6 and d takes e6 happens or doesn't happen? You would want the rook to be on d1, rook a to d1, stacking up with the queen. Okay, so a6, so let's accelerate the pace of our play a little bit. And now we have another option. And Sky, you proposed this on the previous move. Let's do that now. What does he want? He wants b5. What's the drawback of b5? What pawn does it leave undefended? It leaves the c5 pawn undefended. And the king on g7 is already vulnerable to checks along this diagonal. So who could propose a move that serves two purposes? It prevents b5 indirectly. And it gets this knight a little bit more active. The knight is just kind of biting on granite. Not knight a4. We don't need the knight there. We go knight e2. So we're dragging the knight over to the king side where it could participate in an attack. And, okay, b5 is no longer dangerous. He could now play b5. And now the time has come for us to start kingside operations in earnest. So what should we do? In what order should we accomplish things? Yeah, let's go. Time for f4. We could have also gone queen g5, but f4 just seems a little bit more direct. Yeah interesting Alexander I, I didn't realize that well, I'll have to take a look but I think Bishop d3 is more accurate but I, that's that's good to know uh, I'll, we'll take a look no Knights can bite on granite too absolutely they can okay yeah so e6 now play this guy is good he's fast and he's good and we have a very pretty tactical idea I'll begin with a check on c3 to drive the king back. And now we have a very pretty tactic. So we have many possibilities here that basically I think win the game. We could take on e6 and then slide the bishop over to c4. Oh, actually, that's no, that's even stronger. Sorry. I'll show you guys after the game a very cool tactical idea that we had instead. But what I'm seeing here is that after d, e, f, e, his position is just starting to collapse. He's too passive. He's un incapable of holding together everything here. We're attacking his pawn. And now because we've put the pawn on f4, what's going to be our follow-up assuming that he plays rook a to e8? What's going to be our follow-up? d6 was the move, yes. f5. f5 is going to come with a tremendous effect. We're just taking on e6. His entire position totally collapses here. So you can see it's like we played pretty conservatively for a while. But when the time comes, you step on the gas pedal and just because you're playing positionally doesn't mean you can't win quickly and doesn't mean you don't resort to tactics when the time comes. Yeah, knight f5 was interesting, but I feel like this is just less, yeah, it is less adventurous, but maybe less Daniel style. Prepare slowly, attack fast is always the dictum. Knight e5, good move. Good move, but it's not going to help. Now, clearly, we take with the bishop check. King g7, and now we have a crusher. 
You notice that the knight is pinned. That's the first thing to notice. The second thing to notice is that the king and the queen are now on the same, uh, on the same rank. And a very simple tactic comes in for the win. Rook d7. Thank you, Verbal, for the prime. Rook d7 is winning. Boom goes the dynamite. And the game is over. So just a little bit too passive by Black here. That was his main problem. He was just not doing enough to prepare himself for this kind of stuff. Now, by the way, we would have done the same thing had he played king h8. Rook takes queen. Now everything, the wheels come off and he resigns. Very nice. So according to Alexander, Grandmaster Rustamov, uh, knight c3 is still possible. And after e5, just to show you guys the whole idea here, the uh, bottom line here is that knight f is that d5 is not good. Queen d1, king d1, knight g4 with a fork. And white could risk being worse here. And if knight d1, knight e4, and white could risk being worse here too. But according to Alex, knight f3 is the best way to play here. Ed, queen d4. And white retains an edge in the end game, which I totally would believe. But nonetheless, I feel like a lot of players wouldn't want to get an end game that quickly. And I think black's got good chances for equality there. So bishop d3 is the most accurate. Just remember that. And g6, we go h3. Bishop g7, knight. So this is all very simple. I think black is playing well here. This is fine. This is where our opponent started to go off the ledge a little bit. I, I think the knight b, to d knight b to d7 would be a more uh, accurate move. I mean, he's just developing more actively. He goes knight f to d7. Queen d2, preparing to trade the bishops. And c5, we go d5. c5 exacerbates the situation. Now, how can, if black wanted to avoid allowing the trade of bishops, what is the typical way of, of taking the sting out of bishop h6? Yeah, knight f3 before e4 is good too. Rook e8. Rook e8, bishop h6, bishop h8. But the thing is that even though you preserve the bishop, this is still very passive. White could like a, make a move such as queen f4. White could simply bring the rook in to d1 or e1, and we have an, just a phenomenal position here. Oh, f3, interesting. So e, c5, d5, knight e5, we take it. Now we play bishop h6, making him regret the fact that he got his bishop away from the pawn chain. Five bucks from Budazak. Not in the best position in life now, but let me tell your videos. have helped me a lot with learning chess, which is helping me cope with everything. Thank you, that's very sweet. Um, that means a lot. I hope you get through everything, uh, and, and thanks a lot for that. So wh why is what passive? Well, he's not developing. His bishop is bad. We've got a monster center. He's just giving me all the good stuff. He's just giving me all the good stuff. So bishop g7 makes things even worse. He should have definitely kept his dark squared bishop because this is really the only piece that's holding black's position together. And no, not necessarily deco. There's no rule that says that. No, it, it all depends on the situation. Why is bishop h8 passive? Oh, did I say it? No, 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 no. I didn't mean to suggest that this bishop is passive. I meant to suggest that black's entire position is passive. I meant to suggest that black's entire position is passive. In the sense that, I mean, just look at how his pieces are all pushed to the last two ranks. That's all I really mean. I'm not, I don't mean to make a deep point here. Um, this is just bad. Montana gifting to Budazak. Thank you. Okay. So... Queen d2, c5, d5, we take it, we take it, we go rook a d1. And again, how do I find this move? Well, I realize that his only way of trying to cut into my central superiority is to go e6. And in the event of e6, we can take on e6, and this rook is perfectly positioned to x-ray his queen. Now we can move our queen away from d2 um, and cause problems down the d file. This is the only open file. And when there is only one open file, you want to make sure that you are the one controlling it. When you are the one controlling the only open file in the position, that is a huge positional advantage. Okay. Well, the King's Indian played properly is not necessarily uh, an issue. Why shouldn't black take the pawn on d4 versus with the queen after white plays bishop d3? Uh, no. So queen d4 loses the queen. You go bishop b5 check and the queen is uh, toast. Knight c6. You can still take the queen because the knight is pinned. Okay, so that's a that's an important point. So a6, knight e2 is a nice move. E of b5, undefended pawn, vulnerable king, fork, grab the pawn and win the pawn. Knight d7. At this point, I don't even care about b5. 
You know, it's kind of like you're you're attacking him from all sides, and this is like a gnat that you have to brush off from your shoulder. This is just like a harmless move. He's not doing anything at all. And that's another thing which at this level you have to be able to tell yourself is you have to be able to say, I see that my opponent has an idea, but I'm going to ignore it for one reason or another. So catch yourself when you're automatically trying to stop things that aren't dangerous and try to always figure out, is my, is my idea warrant going for it immediately? Do I need to waste the tempo on stopping my opponent's idea if it's not dangerous? Knight e2, knight d7, knight g3. Our knight is poised to sacrifice on f5 or h5. Queen c7, and now it's time for the pawn. So e6 accelerates uh, his demise, for sure. But his position was essentially untenable. I mean, he probably should have gone for maybe, maybe bring the king back to g8 or something to that effect. And we would have gone maybe rook f3 preparing a rook lift. Queen c3 is good. Queen e3 just centralizing the queen preparing f5 is good. There's a million different ideas. But black is not losing. Black is, you know, a good player would be able to hold, hold on with black. This is not, the game is not over. White is overwhelmingly better, but that's, that's bad. Is the bishop super passive? Not really. The bishop is not the greatest bishop in the history of bishops, but so is his. And our bishop has a lot of prospects. If the position opens up, the bishop will, it has a lot of potential energy. This is a classic example of a piece that has a lot of potential energy. If the, this diagonal opens, the bishop might be, uh, precisely the piece that's winning the game first. In fact, the bishop was the piece that won the game once he played e6. Check, takes, takes, bishop c4. So again, it's this, the same goes for white's knight. I think some of you are looking at this position and saying, well, I'm looking at the bishop. It's staring at its own pawn. I'm looking at the knight, and I see the black's g pawn is two squares away from it, and it's limiting its control over these two squares. But you've got to see the bigger picture here. We're going to rely on our pawns and our queen and our rook to open up the position. And the moment that it opens up, sacrifices like knight f5 become possible, and this bishop uh, is perfectly positioned to attack. So you've got to see the big picture. You've got to see the, the you got to play the longer game. Um, and that's a little bit hard to do, but I hope I'm making some sense. So for example, instead of f4, I was considering queen g5, and that created the immediate threat of knight f5 check. And already the knight is jumping into the game. And, you know, you could play e5 at some point and open up the bishop too. So it's always a trade-off. Pieces can be very active in the moment, but they can become very passive if the position changes, or the other way around. Pieces could be not as active in the time, in the moment, but you could know for a almost near certainty that you're going to change the, you're in control of the situation, so you are going to change the position in a way that's going to make the pieces more active. Okay, how to get those pieces off the board? Well, again, you can't guarantee that you won't go wrong. How many games have I lost because I've made a misjudgment? I, I thought a piece would become active and it doesn't. Many, you, that's, that, but that's also where the fun lies. You're able to test your judgment and if you lose a game like that, you wanna ask yourself, well, why did my intuition go, where did my intuition go wrong? What did I think would happen that didn't happen? Why did I think it would happen? You, you're exploring the root cause of your misjudgment. And that's how you can improve your intuition. So for example, you could say, ah, well, I made this observation. I thought my opponent had to do this and he didn't have to do it. So I'm going to try to make less assumptions about what my opponent has to do. It's hard to improve your intuition, but those are some things you could do to try to improve your sort of judgment, uh, judgment on, on the chessboard. Okay, so F4, E6. Well, what are the indicators? The indicator is that he's we've removed his fianchetto bishop from the board. The question is, you mentioned potentially sacking the knight. What were the indicators for when a sacrifice might be worth it? So two things, pattern recognition. I've seen a million games with a sacrifice like this. It's super typical uh, in such situations, super typical uh, in, 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 uh, in, a, you know, in, in positions where, um, where you've removed your opponent's fianchetto bishop and you've gotten the knight to, to g3, this cracks open the um, pawn structure around the king. So for example, just in the last two seconds, I came up with a game here, which really, which really shows this well. Um, and this is quite the, quite the set of players. Just one second, guys. 
So for example, we have a position here, uh, Sultan Khan against Vera Menchik, the first women's world champion. Sultan Khan, very famous player in his own right. So watch what happens in the next couple of moves. Bishop takes h6, Menchik takes on c4, boom, boom. And guess what move Sultan Khan plays? It's the proximity of the knight and the king that kills black here. Knight f5 check comes in, Montana gifting to chess dragon queen. And if g takes f5, you go check, you win back the knight and look at how weak the king is. So bishop takes f5 happens, but now the, the f5 pawn acts as a battering ram. You shatter the defenses around black's king and Sultan Khan goes on basically to deliver checkmate. And he defends for a while, but then he eventually crashes through and he wins. Thank you for the 100. So, you know, when you look at these games, you develop the pattern recognition, the sense for these tactics. And, you know, imagine having seen 30 games like that. That's the first thing you'd be thinking about when you, when you saw this position. Okay, so here, 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 here. And this is very simple. Now, the other last thing I'll say is that d6 was a possibility as well. The idea is to lure the queen into a discovery and then you go bishop b5 winning the game you win the piece um and black can't even give away the queen for a, for a rook and a piece because the knight is going to be hanging anyway but i decided to open up the position this is just more overwhelming because black doesn't have to take the pawn on d6 boom 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 and f5 ends the game on the spot some of you were indicating knight f5 as a possibility Threatening checkmate, sacking the knight, and then perhaps going rook f3, trying to lift the rook in and deliver checkmate. And maybe that's winning, but I feel like at this particular moment, I, um, you know, I, I decided to play less adventurously. I, you know, sometimes you want to weigh the pros and cons. If you're absolutely sure that the pretty move wins, go ahead and play it. But sometimes you want to prioritize, you know, business. Business first, you want to win the game. As one Australian I am said, I like to quote this, um, you play in tournaments to win points, not to paint pictures. And at the end of the day, that's true. Uh, the you know Winning the game, you play to win the game. So rook d7 and the game is over. King h8, rook d7 would have also been game over. Yes, he's completely overwhelmed. And that was the game, guys. This was a nice one. So we're over 1,700. The 10-minute speed run, we will probably go until about 2,300 because 10-minute chess is just not very common over 2,000. And so we'll probably stop when we hit 2300. And at that point, you know, we'll go on to the next project. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm still deciding what that's going to be. But it's been awesome to be to do the speedrun so far. I think it's gone really, really well. I su I really appreciate people's engagement. It 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 uh, brings this to a whole nother level.